Good afternoon. The time is 5.38 p.m. on September 26, 2017, and this public meeting of the District of Columbia State Board of Education is now called to order. The roll will now be called to determine the presence of a quorum. Mr. Haywood, would you please call the roll? <coughs> Excuse me. Ms. Williams. Present. Mr. Jacobson. Mr. Jacobson. Ms. Carter. Ms. Carter. Ms. Wilson Phelan. Present. Ms. Wattenberg. Present. Dr. Woodruff. Present. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Whedon. Present. Mr. Batchelor. Mr. Batchelor. Madam President, you have a quorum. Thank you. A quorum has been determined and the state board will proceed now with the business portion of the meeting. Members, we have a draft agenda before us. Are there any corrections or additions? Seeing no changes, I will entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Is there a second? Second. The motion being properly moved and seconded, I will ask for the yeas and nays. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion is approved. Members, we have the minutes from our August 2nd and se September 6th working sessions before us. Are there corrections or additions to the August 2nd minutes? Are there corrections or additions to the September 6 minutes? Seeing no changes, changes, <clears throat> seeing no changes, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes in block. So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. The motion being properly moved and seconded, I will ask for the yeas and nays. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion is approved. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Karen Williams, Ward 7 representative and president of the State Board of Education. On behalf of the members of the District of Columbia State Board of Education, I want to welcome our guests and our viewing public to our Tuesday, September 26th public meeting. The State Board typically holds its regularly scheduled meetings on the third Wednesday of every month in the old council chambers at 441 4th Street Northwest. Today, we are the guests of the Council of the District of Columbia in room 412 of the John A. Wilson Building. Tonight's agenda includes an expert panel on deeper learning. The panel will delve into the current research on deeper learning to provide, as the State Board continues to push district schools to provide all students with an education that prepares them for college, career, and life. The State Board has honored to receive a grant from the National Association of State Boards of Education to assist us in our work in this area. The State Board will also be voting tonight on two resolutions related to the budget. Each year, the State Board approves a need for appropriations that is sent to the mayor for inclusion in her budget. Our fiscal year 2019 request will provide the funding our three offices need to support the work we do to help district children. Second, we will consider a budget plan for fiscal year 2018 that begins on October 1st, 2017. This budget provides transparency to the public on how we will be spending our, how we will be spending their money. It includes funding for our outreach and engagement efforts and for policy research related to the State Board's work. I want to thank the staff and the members of the Board for their hard work to create this budget over the past few months. One final note, I would like to thank our staff member, Maria Sasochili, Sasochili, I'm sorry, Maria, on spending her 30th birthday with us tonight. We appreciate your hard work and dedication to the State Board. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> I know you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> 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 uh, 
Uh, the superintendent is not here tonight, so we will not be having uh, comments from her. So we will go on to the public comment section of our agenda. The State Board welcomes public participation in activities under our authority. At every public meeting, we begin with testimony from public witnesses on education-related matters. Your comments will become part of our official record. If you are a member of the public and would like to speak at a future public meeting, please contact our staff by email at sboe at dc.gov or by calling 202-741-0888. Tonight we have a single witness, Claudia Concha. Ms. Concha, are you here? Please have a seat at the table. You have three minutes to speak this evening. Please note that you must use your microphone. Your microphone, you have to push the, got it? Push the button. You will also see on your upper right hand side of the witness table a timer. The light will be green for the first two and a half minutes and will turn yellow for the last 30 seconds and will turn red after three minutes. Please begin when you're ready. Executive Director and Board members, Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I would like to provide testimony as a DC Co-Regional Representative for Human Rights Educators USA, or HRE USA, a, na a national network of human rights educators, advocates, and civil society organizations committed to promote human dignity, justice, and peace by cultivating an expansive, vibrant base of support for human rights educators within the US. HRE USA would like to urge the board to initiate the revision process of DC social studies standards with particular emphasis on the incorporation of human rights and humanitarian law principles. DC social studies standards were last reviewed and revised in 2006, more than 10 years ago. DC students deserve updated social studies curricula so they can properly analyze current events and issues that have direct relationship with their classes of history, geography, economics, politics, and government. The incorporation of human rights into the social studies standards will help develop these students' inquisitiveness, critical thinking, sense of civic duty, and respect for human dignity and diversity. Human rights education could also provide DC teachers with new tools to improve teacher-student relations, school culture, and school environment. We understand that the SBOE can't start that revision process alone. Hence, we have sent the same request to OC, the Deputy Major of Education, and Mayor Bowser, in the hope that they show leadership on the loan due revision process. HRE USA has offered the support of our network, including the curricular resources and contacts with human rights education professionals. In closing, HRE USA exhorts the SBOE to update the social studies standards, taking a stock of our city's commitment to human rights which is laid out on the 2008 DC Council Declaration of the District of Columbia as the first human rights city in the nation. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Would you ha did you have a copy for us? Thank you, thank you. I just want to say thanks for coming. I've had that raised with me by a number of people that our social studies standards haven't been revised in a very long time. So I am totally in support of that request and I hope that um, it comes to us. Thank you for coming. Next on our agenda is our fiscal year 2018 budget resolution. The resolution adopts, excuse me, do we have to recognize Mr. Bass? The resolution adopts the State Board's budget at the Council's approved levels of 
$267, with $242,382 being spent on program activities and the remainder on personnel as designated in the FY 2018 agency goals budget that was provided to members and to the public. I will remind members that the resolution adopts the top line budget. If there are additional changes to the agency goals budget, we can discuss these as well throughout the fiscal year. Mr. Haywood? Okay, is there a motion on the resolution? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Having been properly moved and seconded, Mr. Haywood, will you read the resolution into the record? State Board of Education Resolution SR 17-11, DC State Board of Education Fiscal Year 2018 Budget Resolution. Whereas in 2013, the District of Columbia Council approved the State Board of Education Personnel Authority Amendment Act of 2012, effective April 27, 2013, to ensure that the District of Columbia State Board of Education had the authority to operate as an independent agency, including through the hiring of its own staff and preparing its own budget. Whereas the DC State Board of Education staff have prepared a budget that reflects the priorities of the three offices of the State Board, the Office of the State Board of Education, the Office of the Ombudsman for Public Education, and the Office of the Student Advocate. Whereas the proposed budget has been discussed at two working sessions of the DC State Board of Education on August 2nd, 2017 and September 6, 2017. Whereas the DC State Board of Education is appreciative of the trust placed in it by the residents and shall remain open and transparent about its spending. Whereas in the fiscal year that begins on October 1st, 20, excuse me, um, Madam President, that should be 2017. The DC State Board of Education will have a budget of uh, $1,711,267 with $242,382 being spent on program activities and the remainder on personnel as designated in the attached FY 2018 agency goals budget. And whereas any non-personnel expenditure over the amount of 2500 shall require prior approval by the Governance Committee of the State Board of Education. Now therefore be it resolved that on, 20, on September 26, 2017, the State, Board of, uh, the State Board approves its fiscal year 2018 budget. Thank you. Is there discussion or are there amendments on the resolution? Madam President. Yes. I just wanted to take a moment uh, to thank our hardworking staff uh, here at the board and also uh, in the Ombudsman and Student Advocates Office uh, for really um, making thoughtful uh, recommendations to our board about, uh, about our next fiscal year. Uh, we know we don't have a lot to work with, um, but, but I'm glad about these both frugal and thoughtful uh, investments that are going to help our, our operations and our mission uh, to the residents of the district over the next year. Thank you. Any additional discussion? Seeing none, I would like to call the question. The motion is on approval of the State Board Resolution 17-11. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The motion is approved. Next on our agenda is our fiscal year 2019 need for appropriations resolution. The resolution adopts the State Board's request for funds of $1,765,000 with $243,000 being spent on program activities and the remainder on personnel. Is there a motion on the resolution? So moved. Second. Is there a second? Second. Having been properly moved and seconded, Mr. Haywood would read the resolution into the record. State Board of Education Resolution SR 17-12, DC State Board of Education Fiscal Year 2019 Need for Appropriations Resolution. Whereas in 2013, the District of Columbia Council approved the State Board of Education Personnel Authority Amendment Act of 2012, effective April 27, 2013, to ensure that the District of Columbia State Board of Education had the authority to operate as an independent agency, including through the hiring of its own staff and preparing its own budget. Whereas DC Official Code uh, 38-2652D3 reads, beginning in fiscal year 2013, this, the board shall prepare and submit to the mayor for inclusion in the annual budget prepared and submitted to the council pursuant to part D of subchapter four of chapter two of title one, annual estimates of the expenditures and appropriations necessary for the operation of the board for the year. 
All the estimates shall be forwarded by the mayor to the council for, in addition to the mayor's recommendations, action by the council pursuant to section 1-204.46 and 1-206.03C. Whereas the State Board of Education staff have prepared a budget that reflects the need for appropriations to meet the priorities of three offices of the State Board, the Office of the State Board of Education, the Office of the Ombudsman for Public Education, and the Office of the Student Advocate in fiscal year 2019. Whereas the proposed fiscal year 2019 budget has been discussed at three working, excuse me, two working sessions of the State Board of Education on August 2nd, 2017 and September 6th, 2017. Whereas the State Board is appreciative, uh, State Board of Education is appreciative of the trust placed in it by residents and shall remain open and transparent about its spending. And whereas in the fiscal year that begins on October 1st, 2018, the DC State Board of Education proposes a need of, of appropriations of $1,765,000 with $243,000 being spent on program activities and the remainder on personnel and that this re represents an increase of 3% from fiscal 2018 that is dedicated to salary and benefit adjustment. Now therefore be it resolved that on September 26, 2017, the State Board approves its fiscal year 2019 need for appropriation and requests that the mayor include it in her annual budget submission, uh, is include in her annual budget submission, the estimate approved herein. Thank you. Is there discussion or amendments to the resolution? Seeing none, I would like to call the question. The motion is on approval of State Board Resolution 17-12. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion has been approved. Deeper learning is defined by the Hewitt Foundation as a set of six interrelated competencies. Mastering rigorous academic content, learning how to think critically and solve problems, working collaboratively, communicating effectively, directing one's own learning, and developing an academic mindset. At its heart, however, deeper learning is a belief in a child's ability to grow. Tonight, the State Board of Education welcomes three experts in the field of deep learning to share with the board the current research into this phenomenon and how it can impact students. I would like to invite Don Long, Loretta Goodwin, and Philip Lowell to the witness table while I tell the board members of public and the public about their accomplishments. Don Long is a Director of Teaching, Leading and Learning Policy at the National Association of States Boards of Education. With over two decades of experience in education policy, advocacy, and research at the national, state, and local levels, Mr. Long focuses on addressing issues of equity and excellence in the education system. Dr. Loretta Goodwin, is a senior director at the American Youth Policy Forum. Dr. Goodwin is a nationally recognized researcher in high school reform efforts, experimental education, and international education. Philip Lowell is vice president of policy development and government, government relations at the Alliance for Excellent Education, where he leads the Alliance's adv advocacy for federal policies that strengthen policies that will ensure that high school graduates are prepared for their futures. Our panelists will be presenting in a block tonight. Mr. Long, I believe you will be kicking us off. Please begin whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you, Madam President, uh, Executive Director Hayworth, and, and board members. I'm delighted to be here today on behalf of NASB and to serve on a panel with Loretta and Philip. Uh, as you know, we at NASB believe strongly in your leadership as citizens' voice in public education, and so I have to start by acknowledging the great work you've already done in engaging public stakeholders in the development of your ESSA plan and continuing this work with your two task forces on ESSA 
and the high school uh, graduation requirements. And I am pleased to be working with staff on that work. We are here tonight to provide insight into the power of deeper learning to achieve the primary equity and excellence goal today, college, career, and civic readiness for every student. I will give a brief overview of what it looks like, or what it is, and, and why it's important. Loretta on what it looks like in schools, and Philip on college and career readiness policies. I am from Virginia, but in the interest of time, I will be talking fast like I'm from New York. <laughs> There are two keys to understanding deeper learning. First, it gets to the very core of student learning by connecting to students' intrinsic desire to learn, empowering them as active learners. And second, it enables students to learn rich content by applying learning to the real world, learning by doing in authentic contexts, and most importantly, to transfer learning from one context to a new one. I believe all of this means deeper learning empowers active learners, active teachers, and active leaders. It is a set of competencies and learning environments uh, that is not one size fits all, uh, but is tailored to the strengths, values, and needs of individual schools and students. This first take focuses on the competencies. There are six core competencies uh, and these have been developed through the Hewlett Foundation Strategic Initiative to research and advance deeper learning for all students, especially those traditionally underserved. Uh, these are, as you mentioned, uh, academic mastery, problem solving and critical thinking, collaboration, communication, uh, learning to learn, and academic mindset. I'm going to go over them quickly, but you do have a handout that goes into detail. This is a critical point. These six competencies are interwoven and mutually reinforcing so students can master core academic content and to better retain it for future use. This is a student-centered pedagogy that makes content come alive, more rigorous, relevant, and usable, encouraging students to even reach further. In contrast to rote memorization and drill and kill test prep exercises, students engage in higher order thinking skills, problem solving, criti uh, critical thinking, creative thinking, asking questions, and defining uh, and solving new problems. Collaboration along with communication gets to the heart of the soft skills, employability skills that employers demand and that all students need in today's dynamic knowledge economy. Uh, st students are able to work in teams, appreciate and understand diverse perspectives, provide constructive feedback. Deeper learning is about teachers listening to and affirming student voice. It's about students listening and communicating effectively with their peers and teachers, confidently presenting before groups, leading conferences, and being able to manage conflict. These last two competencies, learning how to learn and academic mindset, are what are most distinctive about deeper learning. This is how they achieve and even exceed college and career readiness standards for life beyond high school. In learning to learn, students take ownership of their learning and grow as self-directed learners, able to set goals, assess their learning, monitor their progress, see setbacks as opportunities for reflection and growth. An academic mindset returns to the beginning in engaging students' intrinsic desire to learn, to make sense of the world. Students trust in their own abilities and believe hard work pays off. They persevere through challenging material. They learn from and support each other. Most importantly, they have a joy and thirst of learning. We are going to go over the research, but, but briefly because of time. But there are two major reports. The National Research Council uh, was a comprehensive literature review that showed that deeper learning did lead to the, the skills needed in a rapidly changing world of being able to transfer learning to new uh, situations. And then the 
American Institutes of Research have done a series of studies on deeper learning. Uh, this is on a network of 10 deeper learning school models. Uh, the student sample includes 60% uh, low income, 28% uh, African American, 40% Hispanic, and uh, in many cases, high concentrations of English learners. And that is a summary of the AIR findings. And uh, you'll see that it leads to stronger academic outcomes, uh, improved behavior, uh, higher graduation rates, and, and college going. So this is the first take on what is deeper learning. But to fully unpack the what of deeper learning, you have to know the why. And that way, you can know why educators and schools, why educators boldly claim and schools show that deeper learning is the primary equity strategy. It can enable and it can enable all students to achieve and surpass college and career readiness standards. I want to put this in a context of equity and excellence. Uh, the original ESEA passed in 1965 was one of the many legislative triumphs of the civil rights movement and the efforts to address poverty. ESEA enshrines our national commitment to a high quality education for every student. Now, 60 years later, we're still fighting to close persistent achievement and graduation gaps, but we should note that considerable progress has been made, that we stand on the shoulders of giants. These giants are not um, just educators and policymakers, they're students. Their success stories are the best testimony to great teachers, leaders, and schools, and their progress confirms that we can and must do better. These are more recent milestones that shows we're really gathering momentum. The Equity and Excellence Commission had five recommendations that focused on funding, effective teachers, early education, wraparound services, and accountability. We have college and career readiness in every state uh, for every student. And ESSA, of course, provides you and districts leadership uh, and innovation to pursue these equity goals. And so now, with that context, this is the definition of equity today that I think is most compelling and powerful for you. We define equity as the policies and practices that ensure that every student has access to an education focused on meaningful learning, deeper learning skills, contemporary society requires, taught by competent and caring educators who are able to attend to the student's social, emotional, and academic lead, needs. And that comes from Linda Darlingham and Pedro Nogueira. And so I will leave it here, uh, that we have ever rising expectations in this world. And the why of deeper learning is to educate and enable every high school graduate to succeed in today's accelerating rate of change at work, society, technology, and the economy. And I would say that I think we've uh, never come closer to that goal, and nor is it more urgent. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Loretta. Good evening. My name is Loretta Goodwin. I'm with the American Youth Policy Forum here in Washington, D.C. If you're unfamiliar with the American Youth Policy Forum, we're an educational nonprofit. We work in education, workforce, and youth development. And essentially what we do is put together learning events for policymakers at the national level, state level, and local levels. I've been working on this deeper learning work now for the last six years and have, in that role, taken policymakers to 21 schools throughout the country on these study tours that we run so that they can see what deeper learning looks like in action. And so what I wanted to share with you this evening was an opportunity to see what deeper learning looks like. So I want you to just for a moment think about a powerful learning experience that you have had and what made it a powerful learning experience. Actually, can we just go back one slide and play the video? If I can get help with that.
Oh, back. One more slide back. That on, yeah. deinstitutionalize school our best work happens when there is an intersection between a kid's passion and a need in the world you're not being cocky to say you have something to give the world so I'm trying to link your exploration to the personal hero into our expedition around the Arab Spring population as a collective hero we have 86% of the kids who enter high school graduate. Pretty decent number, unless you look at 14% of 187,000 kids. Yeah. That's a lot of kids not making it, and we have to do better. The mantra that resonated through the state of Maine was, the model we have was invented in 1892. It seems so, few things should change. <laughs> and they really hadn't. Yeah. Commissioner by the name of Susan Gendron, who brought in the Reinventing Schools Coalition. Uh, there were a number of districts who had started in 2002, 2003, moving towards a personalized learning experience. No matter which school in the, in the district that you go to, each of us has that proficiency-based learner-centered model. They are learning by doing. They are being graded upon what they are doing. So our kids have different needs, and as a school, we need to figure out what those needs are. How do they learn best? You now had a community of learners among the school and district folks that were trying to figure out how to do this and wanting to work together to do it. And when school started, we got legislators to visit some of these schools so they could see what was going on. The entire junior grade went to New York to help people who were affected by Hurricane Sandy. We went and helped people rebuild homes and then we did a documentary of them, asked them how their life has been impacted. That really affected how I saw global warming, climate change, and how it can affect people on a personal level instead of a wide scale level. There's always an opportunity to revise, so if I don't get the grade I want, I can usually work harder and work with the teacher and fix it. They recognize when I'm not putting in all my effort and they kind of catch me on it and they're like, this is not your best work, so try some more. And the piece I would say that has come through in the 20 years is you can say graduation by proficiency, you can do whatever you want to do about every kid has to, but until you have established a relationship with a student, nothing's going to change and nothing's going to happen. The state of Maine supports proficiency-based work, and we've been doing that for 20 years, so it's helped validate our work to have the legislation that supports our values, and it strengthens our standing in the community to know that we're not just making this stuff up, but that it's supported by best educational practices as well as legislators in the state of Maine. I want to give students the opportunity to voice their opinions and what they experience. This is grassroots. This is, this is from kids. We're focusing on student voice and choice. So having that network and that community there working together reinforced that this is where a lot of the state was going, that there was real leadership there, and that if the state could come in and support that, it was a bottom-up approach. My girls are the ninth generation of my family who live in this state. And I wonder, are these two going to be in Maine? Are they going to make careers in Maine? Are they going to raise families in Maine? And I worry about it. I think we all do. Making sure the kids that come out of this high school back here are innovators and inventors and creative and are able to figure out how we're going to create a new world, a new life here in Maine. And you'd like to think that we, you know, moved a switch over here and turned a thing over there and 30 years down the road, these schools are different and these kids are coming out different because we did that. <laughs> it's important stuff and it's powerful stuff.
So that was a video on what is different about these deep, deep learning environments in Maine. Um, not sure if we can get back to the PowerPoint. Uh, and what I wanted to just call out was some aspects of deeper learning that we see there and that we see in a lot of the schools that we bring policymakers to. Just calling out student ownership, that there is voice and choice among students in terms of what they're learning and they have great ownership in terms of also showcasing their learning. There's a lot of learning by doing. They are involved in projects and you heard about one of the projects mentioned in the video there where they went and created a documentary. They work in teams, they're learning collaboration skills. They're also really learning to revise. It's not just once and done in terms of projects, but they have an opportunity to do things over and over and get better and better at what they're doing. They also have performance-based assessments, so they have an opportunity to put together portfolios and showcase their learning through presentations, exhibitions, and not only to peers and to st other teachers, but also to members in the community. So it's really hands-on and relevant real-world learning that they're engaged in. They have an opportunity to, to reflect on the quality of their work. And what then happens is that you have a very different role for teachers. Teachers are supporting students' personal development and getting to know each child so that they can really help them become competent and confident. They have high expectations of all students. They also facilitate learning and are not in front of the classroom just delivering lectures, but are really wandering around the classroom making sure that students are involved in projects and getting their work done. And teachers are also challenging students and helping them make connections as they teach in, in many of these schools in interdisciplinary teams, so the math teacher with the biology teacher, et cetera. And these teachers also have time to collaborate with their colleagues because you cannot put together a project, an interdisciplinary project, without a lot of time to really plan that well. I'll just highlight some other school factors as well that are critically important to this deeper learning agenda. There is a sense in these schools of creating a community of learners, that there is a culture of high expectations and that they are helping students think not just to, to high school graduation, but how do they, what do they do after high school? There's also professional development by and for teachers and leaders, and a high priority is placed on that, and a culture of lifelong learning is really engendered in these schools. There are a variety of ways that deeper learning is being implemented around the country in urban settings, and you have some examples there. There's a project-based emphasis at schools like High Tech High in San Diego, much closer to home, and if you'd like to go and see it, you can go right across the river in Arlington to the Career Center, and there's a new school, Arlington Tech, that really showcases this deeper learning work and that AYPF has led various teams to already. Expeditions are being done by Expeditionary Learning, now EL Education, and Capital City Public Charter School here in the district is one such school. School within a school, um, Los Angeles High School of the Arts in California, and then this work is not just happening in isolated schools, but really is being taken to the district level. And one of the networks that is doing that really successfully is the New Tech Network. And one of the schools is Napa New Tech. I'll leave you, and I will be leaving this book with you, Book on Deeper Learning by Monica Martinez. Very readable. And this highlights work in eight deeper learning schools that gives you a little bit more information on what this looks like on the ground. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you this evening. I clearly need to apply some deeper learning skills to my uh, PowerPoint. There we go. All right. So thank you very much. I'm Philip Lovell with the Alliance for Excellent Education. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you this evening. The Alliance is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to ensuring that all children have the opportunity to graduate from high school, college, and career ready. We have a goal of ensuring that 90% of students graduate from high school by 2020. We've made a lot of progress towards that goal, but we know that it's not enough for students to just graduate from high school. We, th we want them to graduate 
ready with the deeper learning competencies so they'll be prepared for the economy of today and the economy of tomorrow. I'm going to present a bit on the why of deeper learning from an economic and from an equity perspective, and I'll leave you with some thoughts around um, policy recommendations. Excellent. All right. So from an equity perspective, we know that today more than half of public school students are either students of color or low-income students. We know that the Latino enrollment in public schools has increased by nearly 50 percent, by 47 percent, between 2001 and 2011. We know that the white population in public schools has actually declined by 12 percent between 2001 and 2011. And what this means is that we need to do better for the kids that we have historically done the least well with from an equity perspective. Translating that into the economic perspective, we know that by 2025, 68% of jobs will, will require at least some level of post-secondary education. So if we do not do better by the kids that we have done the least for, we will be hurting them from an equity perspective and we will be hurting our country from both an equity perspective and an economic perspective. The good news, like I said, is that we are making progress. This shows our um, graduation rate from high school and our graduation rate from post-secondary. The District of Columbia is actually doing better than the national average when it comes to the post-secondary um, graduation rate, but there still is certainly work to be done in order to ensure that all kids are ready for, uh, for today's economy. In 2015, we know that, if, um, that for some people, for probably everyone in this room, the moral imperative for a high quality education is enough to motivate us to be in this room to do the hard work of educating kids every day. If the Bible, if our ethics don't do it for us in order to get us in the room and make us motivated by education, the Bible doesn't work, the billfold will. If 90% of kids have graduated from school in 2015 instead of the almost 70 percent, DC would have seen an additional 9.2 million dollars in spending, 12.9 million dollars increase in earnings, additional investments, 31 million dollars in home sales, 2.7 million dollars in auto sales, all these estimates demonstrating that the economy is really dependent upon what we do in our classrooms. But like we said, we can't assume that every student who graduates from high school is actually prepared, or they are also not just graduating with a, with a piece of paper in hand, but they are actually college are ready. This is critical because if you look at the job growth since the Great Recession, 99% of the jobs that have been created went to people with more than a high school diploma. Only 1% went to just people with a, with, a, with a diploma or below. DC is actually doing pretty well in comparison to many of its um, peers across the country when it comes to, uh, to actually preparing students for college as measured by the ACT. This has improved, DC's um, performances has improved um, considerably over the last five years. Fundamentally, I would make the argument that DC is on the right path and I'd like to share a few thoughts as to why. I know that, um, that the council is considering, is reviewing DC's graduation requirements and I have to tell you that as our organization has looked at graduation requirements across the country, I think that DCs are among the strongest. So if anything, I would definitely recommend that you do nothing to weaken them. DC has one set of criteria for, for graduation, and they are aligned to your standards. A number of states, believe it or not, they might have college and career ready academic standards, but those standards are not, but their graduation requirements are not actually aligned to those standards. And many states have multiple pathways 
to a diploma, whereas DC has one set of standards. And what we see in the states that have multiple pathways to a diploma, multiple does not mean all equally rigorous. And the students who tend to get the less rigorous diploma are our historically underserved students. So I just urge a lot of caution as DC pursues this uh, or explores this to not lower your standards and to ensure that all kids are not just are, are encouraged to achieve to the highest and that and that lower pathways are not permitted as part of the DC system. In addition, um, your assessment system is strong. You're using the park assessment, which is aligned to the state standards. At the high school level, you're also incorporating the SAT as part of the state's accountability system. Speaking of the accountability system, uh, you have what I think are a well-balanced array of indicators in the, in the plan that was approved by the board to, to implement the Every Student Succeeds Act. You include as part of your school quality measures at the high school level, measures of AP and IB performance and participation. You also include in the performance on the SAT, so I think that you're, um, you're doing a good job of, of pushing towards more than just a high school diploma. And in addition, your plan is very equity focused. Very few states where they have a rating system, look at the overall rating and say, we're going to look at, we're going to ensure that at least a certain percentage of that rating is focused on the performance of historically underserved students. In DC, 25% of your overall school rating is based on the performance of historically underserved students. Not many states took that approach and I applaud you for doing so. So I think that you are, um, you're on the right path here in, in sustaining the growth that uh, the DC has seen over time. A few opportunities to consider moving forward, especially as, um, as the new um, Every Student Succeeds Act gets implemented, just to ensure and concentrate on, on, on ensuring that all kids have access to rigorous coursework, whether that's advanced placement, international baccalaureate, dual enrollment, making sure that all kids have the chance to earn college credit while they're still in high school, one way to think about it. And another thing to consider is how um, DC can enhance as, um, as Dr. Goodwin and, and, um, and Mr. Long were describing, these type of work-based learning experiences, experiential learning um, for, for kids. And one thing that a number of districts are doing, and um, some states statewide are looking at, how to integrate career and technical education with rigorous academics, work-based learning, and dual credit. And we can I'd be happy to talk um, in, at greater length um, on this. But um, we've seen that where this is happening with, with quality, the kids are graduating from high school with the goals that, we're, that we all have in mind, really prepared for college and going on to post-secondary education. Just a few resources for you. DeeperLearningForAll.org, great website um, for resources. Um, the research that our organization has done we're around different diploma pathways, there's a link to, um, to the report. And um, for, um, for an update on what's happening at the federal level in education policy, we do a, a quick five minute video update that I thought I would share um, a link to in case you are, um, it's of interest. Uh, like, I said, like I said, I appreciate um, your time and attention and your commitment to, um, to these topics. Thanks very much for having us. Thank you for joining us tonight. If you don't mind, we'll let the board members ask you some questions so they can get a little deeper learning tonight. <laughs> We're going to limit their first round to four minutes apiece. We'd like to start. Everyone have questions? Is this okay? I'll start with Mr. Bachelor. I'll pass. I'm still writing mine down. Oh, <laughs> all right. Um, Go ahead. He's thinking deeply about the. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I just have a couple quick questions. I really loved that you um, passed around the six core competencies, um, especially um, hitting on not just mastery of content and memorization, but really making sure that we're uh, working on critical thinking, analytical problem solving, et cetera. Um, you often see a lot of that at uh, post-secondary and even in law school it's one of the things that I always talk about is really learning the critical thinking skills required for today's world um, can I just quickly ask uh, how many states do you guys know offhand have integrated any form of deeper learning into their curriculums in, into any schools 
Oh, I can speak to okay. uh, some of the states. Okay. I, I, I wouldn't be able to give you a number. I've, I've gotten uh, but some I highlights. But I can point yeah. to uh, uh, Virginia mm -hmm. and uh, New Hampshire, Iowa as leading states in okay. integrating uh, deeper learning into their curriculum. And, okay. and with New Hampshire and, and Iowa, mm -hmm. they have followed a competency-based model, right? Uh, but, but not Virginia. Okay. Um, and I love that, uh, Dr. Goodwin, that you mentioned urban because that was one of my questions, urban areas, what uh, urban areas. Uh, with that comes, I guess, especially the, the schools that we saw in Virginia and DC. Uh, those are charter schools who often have smaller class sizes. Would you, because of the problem solving skills, the group learning, would you uh, suggest and, and even the amount of responsibility each student has to take on with deeper learning practices would you suggest making class sizes smaller in, in integrating these poly these curriculums and how would you best go about that in a classroom layout I, I, I will um, answer that and say that the, the class sizes in most of the schools that we have been bringing people mm -hmm. to those schools are the majority of them are smaller schools. Mm -hmm. However, we, one of the things we're really focused on going forward is really highlighting the places where this work has been taken to scale and scaled up to what we would consider regular high schools. So for example, in Napa, California, they started out at Napa New Tech, which is a relatively small school, but the public high school in Napa is now also a deeper learning school and that work has been taken up to the district level and scaled up. And the New Tech Network is doing that in several states throughout the country. And they're not the only ones, but they're the more prominent network that is doing this work right now. Uh, the class size, depending on how well teachers are trained and can um, facilitate this work, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to reduce the class sizes. I think that a lot of this work really depends on making sure that teachers get the kind of training to be facilitators and a lot of teachers are still trained in very traditional ways of standing in front of a classroom and delivering lectures and so that's something that we also pay attention to in terms of thinking about how teachers can be trained differently and places like high tech high have put in place their own teacher training programs and graduate their own teachers so that they have a force that is familiar with how to do this deeper learning work so that's another big piece to pay attention to. If you're going to put deeper learning in place, you really have to think about how you're going to train the, the teaching force that's going to make this happen. Um, I have just one more follow-up question. Um, in regards to implementing deeper learning, especially in urban areas, we see children from multiple different backgrounds, multiple different families, uh, different situations, which um, attendance in school uh, plays a large part. And with uh, the core competencies of deeper learning, this requires um, more attendance uh, based in the classroom and more responsibility on the student. Have you seen any correlations between attendance? Perhaps this makes attendance rise because students uh, feel a need at, to be responsible, but uh, have you seen any correlation between deeper learning and attendance? I, I don't know if you want to speak. Yeah, I'm not sure that I've, um, that I've seen it studied, but I think that um, what you're saying, uh, sometimes um, it's helpful when research confirms the obvious, but I think that it's safe to say that uh, that absent, that chronic absence is a problem when you're trying to educate kids. And frankly, the fact that um, that the, the DC has prioritized chronic absenteeism as part of its as part of its accountability system, to me, is part of the policy infrastructure that's mm -hmm. helpful and necessary to uh, to implement oh. deeper learning. I would say it's not sufficient, but but that the district is doing the right thing in prioritizing chronic absenteeism as part of its, um, as part of, of its policy framework. And um, I will say from visits yeah. that we've taken people to, when, when we talk to the students, they talk about the fact that they're much more engaged in their learning because of the projects that they're working on. A lot of the projects take them into the communities and really have them interacting with and working on pro priorities that are important to them, and that's what brings them into the school. 
I'd also really underscore that relationship piece that was mentioned in the video and the fact that when teachers have really strong relationships and each student feels like they're known not just by one individual in the school but by many, that's what keeps them coming to school. Many of these schools also have advisory periods which are opportunities to really get to know a cohort of students really well and one teacher moves with that cohort oftentimes in many of these schools from ninth grade all the way through to twelfth grade. And when they have that support system at the school, that's what also keeps them coming back to, to the school. May I briefly add that, um, as I mentioned, the core strength of, of deeper learning is engaging students, their intrinsic desire to learn. And there are other studies that we didn't mention of schools in California and New York that show uh, much better attendance uh, and behavior and, and so much more responsible um, uh, student engagement in schools. And just one last anecdote that, um, while it doesn't speak to, to attendance per se, it speaks to something that's equally important, and that is um, school climate. In, um, in one high school in Los Angeles that, uh, that has implemented a deeper learning strategy, the principal um, tells a story of how, um, as a result of implementing their deeper learning strategy, that their expulsion rates, their um, and their suspension rates um, have gone down, and that money that was spent on things like metal detectors and security guards are now, is now spent on lab equipment. Very nice, thank you very much. No further questions. This one, bro. Hi, thanks for coming. I have a one minute question for Mr. Long and then three minutes uh, directed, I guess, mainly to Mr. Lovell, but also to everybody. So the first question is, when you spoke, and I also see it in the Hewlett Six Competencies, it talks about students build their academic foundation in subjects like reading, writing, math, and science. Mm -hmm. And I was very disturbed and distressed that social studies was not in there, um, especially because, and anybody who follows my tweets, I was just recently tweeting a Robert Marzano chart that shows that um, the vocabulary and the background knowledge that you need for reading comprehension comes, 50% of it actually comes from the social studies. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm both, uh, so, why, so why is it not in there as a? Uh, well, I think that might be more a, um, uh, an issue related to the research, uh, but I do know that deeper learning schools uh, provide many opportunities for students to really deeply engage in social studies, uh, community service, designing research projects to, to uh, define problems in their communities, uh, engaging in civic life, uh, doing presentations before state boards of education, engaging in, in, in government activities. Uh, so I think the, the uh, principles of, of deeper learning really permit the kinds of, of strengths in social studies, of inquiry-based learning, uh, asking questions, uh, groups of people coming together to try to affect change. Uh, that's actually one of the uh, principles in, in uh, Maine's uh, guiding principles of uh, related to deeper learning is empowering students to be change agents. Um, so, so I totally agree with you and I would just encourage, I just think there's such a disposition to drop the social studies mm -hmm. and we've seen it all over the place and I would just really encourage you as you move forward with this and in your materials um, I would hope that you would include social studies and even talk specifically about history and geography civics and so on so that's my um, that was my one minute right. now my as a former major in history in college I couldn't agree more okay uh, um, my my three minute question is um, starting with Mr. Lovell you talked about how our requirements are very high for high school graduation here in DC and I think um, uh, and that's true how do you but w but as you probably also know we have a a big issue that many students who graduate if you use the park score as an example or if you use higher education um, persistence as, as an indicator um, they're not necessarily graduating um, proficient in those things and how do you propose to measure that? I mean, how do, I mean, do you propose, I mean, we have the high requirements at, at some level, everybody's doing their very best to bring students to these higher levels. What do you propose? Should, should students not graduate if they don't have it? Or what, what do you propose? Um, 
I may not be understanding the question. You said, how do you propose to measure? I think that well, you have I mean, we graduate students based on ta on meeting the requirements, but yes. we know that just meeting the requirements is insufficient. Or well, well, isn't, well that, that all not, kids are not actually right. Right. So, would you recommend? I mean, we have a high school graduation task force that's thinking about these issues. Would you recommend? that the requirement for graduation should be something different than, than just taking these courses? So in other words, does and, and performance- passing, And passing yes, these courses? Does, does performance actually, does, does performance actually matter? I think that, um, that it's perfectly appropriate to consider raising the bar somehow or another, or at least giving credit for, um, for performance. So here's an example. So in Indiana legislation passed that um, in addition to the state's core 40 requirements, which are essentially equivalent to, um, to DC's graduation requirements, in addition to that, students have to demonstrate an area of college and career readiness. And now their board and their department of ed um, are considering what those pathways for college and career readiness are. So there'd be some flexibility, but, they'll, but there would also be more of a push to ensure that, uh, that students are preparing with, uh, are graduating with more, than a, uh, with more than a diploma in hand. But they don't, you don't yet know what they're going to propose. So um, the legislation outlines seven areas for the, uh, that, that uh, require some additional flushing out. So for example, it includes things like advanced placement, international baccalaureate, dual credit, um, and then the board will be working with, uh, with their department, I, is my understanding, to, um, to outline the decision rules around the implementation. But I think it's a model that's worth, that's worth looking at. Anybody else? Thank you. Mr. Mr. Jones? Thank you, Madam President. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I, most of my, well, my questions I want to be directed towards uh, Philip Lovell. That's pronouncing your name correctly? Lovell, but I've responded to far worse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I appreciate the way you tied the, uh, your presentation into to economics with increased uh, high school graduates. Uh, but I'm curious, where, where did some of those numbers come from? From assuming that we could get to 90%, we'd have, did you say, 950 more graduates? Yes, which actually in the grand scheme of things in comparison to other states isn't that many. I think in comparison to the, to the ninth grade cohort in D.C., it's, um, it's actually a, a decent number. Um, so the, um, the source for the graduation data is um, a large database of education data. The economic estimates come from a, a firm with which we contract, and I'd be happy to share them, the methodology information with you offline if that's helpful. Okay, and th those are specifically related to the district? Yes. Okay. Now, does that, is there an assumption, or, or maybe you don't know, that after they graduate, is there post continued education? Does yes, that so the, the model looks at DC's data on post-secondary enrollment and estimates the percentage of new graduates that will go on to post-secondary as part of that model. Okay, all right, so what you showed does not, so it does not doesn't translate to those high school graduates and the economic numbers and purchasing power. It, it assumes that they're going to continue in their education, and as a result, those economics kick in. So not all of the graduates, but it, it looks at DC's prior data on the percentage of students that are enrolling in post-secondary and graduating, and then from that drives the estimate. So it doesn't assume that 100% that of, the, of, the, of the new graduates are going to go on to post-secondary. Okay, all right, because you tied it to housing sales and new car sales. Yes, so, what it, so, so the estimates look at, and they're based on the, um, the earnings of the new graduates in the mid-range of their careers, so by age 39, okay. and the impact um, of just this one class of new graduates. So for the total impact on the economy, you can think to yourself of, so that's just one class, if we increase the graduation rate for multiple classes, those economic benefits 
would aggregate. Okay, okay. Now I feel better about those numbers. I was a little concerned about uh, those numbers if you didn't have the relevant uh, data behind it. Sure. Uh, now the new car sales, it, I am a little uh, concerned about that. Where, where did those numbers come from? So it's the same um, economic estimates based on prior data, which I'd be happy to. Um, Are they assuming they're buying those cars in the district? Or just nationally? <laughs> That I can't tell you. <laughs> we have no dealerships in the district. Yeah. I know that. That's what I'm getting at. Oh, okay. There you go. A disproportionate amount of the parking fines in, in, my, in my experience. Okay. <laughs> because for me, the economics is, is, is all local. And so whether it's income tax, sales tax, real estate tax, uh, the data for me is, is focused on this city. Sure. Uh, and it's less important to me if, if those are national numbers. Oh, sure, you know, th those are the DC numbers. I can share with you the national numbers, but, okay. um, but those are the DC numbers. All right, well, I appreciate that. Thank you. you bet. Thank you all for being with us this evening. I was curious about whether you know of a state that's implemented very effective career standards. I think we often talked about, talk about career in college as if it's one word. Uh, and as the co-chair of the high school graduation task force in the city, one of the questions we're wondering about is who's developing strong career standards and really is the park uh, aligned with so-called career outcomes and standards? I know there's been research associated with success in college for especially freshmen who are persevering and are prepared for college, but in terms of career, I haven't seen any of that data. So there is a lot happening in this space. I'll give you one example from the state of California. So um, in California, an initiative was started called Linked Learning. It started in nine districts about a decade ago. And the idea behind Linked Learning was exactly that, to prepare students not just for college and not just for a career, but really for both. Students need to be ready for, for both. So in nine districts, they started by integrating rigorous career and technical education with rigorous academics, with work-based learning, and with student supports. I think someone had mentioned that kids bring a lot of issues sometimes into the classroom, so you have to meet their comprehensive needs in addition to their academic ones. The state provided, over the years, they found this to be successful and the state has um, done a number of things in terms of their policy to expand this, a lot of it having to do with funding, um, some of it having to do with, um, with uh, clarity around their dual enrollment policy, but basically to expand this idea. And the research on it is showing that students in high quality pathways and quality really matters here because work-based learning can be great and work-based learning can just be something else that students are doing. Um, but, uh, but for high quality programs, they're showing increases in their graduation rates and they're showing increases in, um, in post-secondary enrollment. Um, I'm curious about Joe. Um, I'm curious about your Comment related to lowering standards or lower pathways was another set of terms that you use. Yes. And I'm, I'm, I would just love for you to define what lower means. So broadly, it would be standards that are not aligned, graduation standards that are not aligned to, this, to the district's college and career ready standards. Specifically, if you were to have, if you were to be requiring um, fewer credits for um, in, in math, for example, or to not include, say, Algebra 2 as part of your standards. Say so that would be a lowering of the standards. And um, in a number of states, um, they, um, they do not have, they do not require as many credits as, um, um, per subject as what, um, as what DC requires. And, and how, in your experience in this, for anybody who has information on this, does that align to actual success in life associated with students? So what, what I'm saying by that is to my colleague from Ward 3's point, what we have right now are a number of students who are receiving a diploma who are actually not prepared for the next steps. Because oh. our diploma actually says that what you, you, you could get a D minus in every subject from freshman all the way through your senior year and you could receive the diploma 
and that accumulated loss of content knowledge wouldn't serve you well. And so when, when you're talking about lowering standards, it's, it's tricky to figure out like, what does that really mean when already we have um, students that are not well prepared for, for life after college? Even some of our students who have high GPAs are telling us that. Oh, sure, I, and I, um, I couldn't agree more with you. Um, I would, I think that your, the, the standards that you currently have are a good starting point Modifying those standards, though, are probably not going, it's not going to result in students being um, wholly better prepared. It's, I think it's more of an issue of instruction of maybe it's access to rigorous coursework. It's ensuring that when students are earning a credit that it's with more than just a D, uh, as you were saying. And, and like I said earlier, I think that the, uh, the, the approach that Indiana is taking, where in addition to meeting the, the the course requirements that they're adding um, a requirement around college and career preparation as defined by seven pathways, seven options that are, um, that are, I wouldn't say that they're all equally rigorous, they're still working through them, but um, that that's an option that would be worth considering. So that you're really concentrating on, on content. And I think also just, I think also just looking at California once again, because they have alignment between the high schools, what students are learning in high school and what they need to be successful as they enter University of California state school system. Mm -hmm. And so there is alignment between those courses, which really has cut back on the need for remediation. And so I think just looking at that intersection as well between what's happening in the high schools and what's happening in post-secondary arenas is also really critically important. <clears throat> I would like to add that in our work with our deeper learning stipend states, uh, we are doing a lot of uh, work on career readiness, and I'd be glad to share uh, uh, some of that with you. Uh, we have identified a number of states uh, that have very good definitions and standards for college and career readiness uh, and the policy alignment that goes along with it, and, um, and I think that might be very helpful for your task force. That would be great. Thank you so much. if it's on there we go um, I want to echo the sentiment that a couple of my colleagues have expressed about lowering standards for some students to achieve graduation um, I think that happens far too commonly um, I'll also as a proud ally and I Illinois graduate um, express some concern of relying too much on anything that comes from Indiana but uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> The, the why of deeper learning is something that I think we all, at least something we all should be striving for. Um, and I think it's also something, and it's something that's happened at back to school nights across my ward and my part of the city that we've asked schools about and they say is happening, but I'm not necessarily sure it is happening. What are the types of indicators that we as policy makers should be including on things like school report cards to in, that would indicate for parents whether or not this is really happening in our school. What are the types of things that we should be including in those measures? I feel like I've been a microphone hog, so I apologize. <laughs> but, uh, um, so um, a couple things. I would look at the type of work being done in the classroom and then there are more quantifiable things that are that some would consider to be more proxies for deeper learning, but um, you know I think that looking at performance and advanced placement, performance in an international baccalaureate, for example, the types of projects that are required as part of the international baccalaureate experience is an example of is a, is a really great um, example of deeper learning. There, is, um, there are other experiences that are um, harder to quantify, but that some of the, some of the, um, some of the schools, uh, groups of schools that are implementing deeper learning, they implement really rigorous projects. So not just let's put together a poster and present on what's in the poster, or let's put together a PowerPoint and present on a couple of slides. But uh, these are students that are making calculations and models on how to build a bridge. <laughs> They've got 3D printers in their classroom. They're, they're doing robotics. 
So there are different, um, there, there's a robustness to the classroom experience that, uh, that really speaks to deeper learning. And at the same time, you want to not just see something that's neat in the classroom, you want to make sure that it's rigorous and that it's transferable, that it matters for, for college. And that's where um, I think you look at things like the percentage of students that are earning industry recognized credentials. You look at the percentage of students that are earning credit for college while they're in high school. So you have a balance between the, the quantify. You, you look at the percentage of students that are entering college without remediation. Huge. Uh, so you look at these things that, um, that, are, that are sort of proxies for, um, for the measure. And I think that, I keep doing that, sorry. Okay. I think that in addition to those, uh, a lot of these deeper learning schools, students are putting together portfolios of their work and they're not just doing it in the final grade of high school. So they're doing it in starting in ninth grade. So you're looking for that progression of learning over time. Ninth grade, 10th grade, it gets a little bit more rigorous and then 11th grade and then in 12th grade. A lot of times they also have prep classes where they're being taught these skills so that they can be successful in putting together those presentations of their learning. I think there's also a, a number of schools we're pushing them now to really also not think about just the data on getting students into that first year of post-secondary, but how many students are actually persisting and are you, are you tracking your students to show how many students are actually graduating successfully from post-secondary, and in how many years are they doing that? So keeping track of that data and having a better sense of how students are progressing. I'll also just point you to the Asia Society Schools, which is one of the networks, and their students are engaging in trips overseas, and so they're those kinds of opportunities of learning where students are going abroad and doing projects abroad, coming back, sharing that learning, they're also very invested in doing community-related projects, which they have to research and, and then invite the community into. So there are a number of different ways to try and get a handle on this, but admittedly, it's, it's, it's tough because it's, we don't have a lot of different ways to assess this. But I think another way that you can really get a better sense of it is really to go on a listening tour yourselves and go to some of these schools and see what students are doing. Things like that don't happen in a lot of public schools that we think of my, myself, I'm in Arlington County, and I keep pushing, for example, for student-led conferences. Schools where there are student-led conferences have students taking ownership of their work from ninth grade and they are leading those parent-teacher student meetings. They are not sitting passively by, but they're the ones that are taking ownership of their learning, talking about their, their goals, and talking and assessing where they are in terms of their own learning. And that gets to that learning how to learn, uh, deeper learning competency. So those, those are just some of the things that you could see in some of these schools. Um, thank you all. We're well over time, so I won't say too much here. but. Student-led conferences, I think, are fabulous, and many of the D.C. schools, D.C. public schools, D.C. public charter schools, and my ward and across the city have those. Um, very proud of the push in Ward 6 at Eastern High School, Elliott Hine Middle School for IB. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's uh, phenomenal, but I do question the implementation and the fidelity to the model. Um, one of my big pushes over the last year has been around resource allocation and you look at um, Elliott Hine Middle School and the DC budget, um, the promise and the actual implementation are two different things. So in getting back to some objective measure that informs parents and communities about whether or not we're meeting this, and this goes back to that equity issue, we're, we're, not, we're not achieving that standard that we're striving for. I'm hearing things about 3D printers and robotics. Often we hear that these programs are offered and they're really not, um, or they're in paper on, on paper only. Um, so I'd be really interested in continuing the conversation about how do we verify whether or not these things are happening, especially for 
our most at-risk students and in our most at-risk schools. Dr. Woodruff? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I am an advocate for expeditionary learning, and um, I believe that it should start in pre-K. I believe that um, we have many Montessori schools that are existing here in the district, and that's kind of what happened before we got to the expeditionary learning um, title name um, because a lot of it started in Montessori and a lot of those families um, um, I can see them immediately looking for programs that can take their child in the pathway um, of expeditionary learning from pre-k all the way through high school I'm interested in knowing if um, there has been any studies done where it shows um, how children are um, faring uh, academically and on assessments when they've been in a program that has expeditionary learning that starts in earlier grades and takes them through high school. I think it's wonderful to have them in high school, but I also believe that it's something that must start earlier than high school. And as we um, look at um, high school requirements, it would be great that um, requirements in middle school and elementary school um, have some of the same pathways so that by the time children get to high school, it's, they're not new to presenting um, their projects. And um, so one of the questions that I have for you all is that um, I am totally an advocate for college ready, but I also recognize that there are so many children in the district that that may not be a pathway. And so expeditionary learning in trades are just as important. Um, I see people come into my home and they um, learn to be an electrician or a plumber and it started because they had a parent that would take them with them. That's expeditionary learning with them. And as a result, they got certification and they, they learned how to have their own business. So it, that, is, that may not be a, a pathway to college, but it is a pathway to a paycheck that may make more money than I do. So I, I look at the, the fact that, yes, I would love to see all our students go on to um, a university, and, but I also believe that expeditionary learning can be done in, in trade as well. And I would like to see um, it, it spoke to and what you all think of that particular um, way of addressing expeditionary learning. Uh, in a former life, I used to uh, work on a, apprenticeship programs and, and workforce development programs. And, and I can say that when we talk about college and career readiness and the importance of post-secondary education, that includes two-year colleges, vocational colleges, and I would definitely think that would include apprenticeship programs. And the key is are they aligned with high demand, high skill, um, and high paying jobs? And um, I definitely support uh, that view that apprenticeships are, are something that would be very valuable. And, uh, and that follows along with um, the work-based learning that is encouraged in uh, deeper learning and contextual learning. And, and um, so when we say that they're not going to college, we always ought to be very careful. People often think that means a four-year college. No, two-year technical uh, community colleges uh, can be very good and uh, apprenticeship programs. Uh, the key is that a high school diploma really is just not enough in today's economy. I, um, I, I second that um, completely. <laughs> I would strongly associate myself with, um, with, uh, with Mr. Long's comments. And um, I just note that I think that DC and every other state has a real opportunity to enhance that type of experience 
um, as the new law gets implemented. Specifically, the law requires that any high school where a third of students aren't graduating that has to implement comprehensive support and improvement. And that gets, def that intervention really gets defined locally. It just has to be based in evidence. There's a lot of evidence behind the type of education that you're describing. Whether you're looking at National Academy Foundation, whether you're looking at, I give the example of linked learning in California, um, career academies, there's a lot of evidence showing that when students um, start their career orientation, their career awareness in high school or beforehand, and um, when there's a career overlay to the academics that they do better. In fact, they're, the their research done by MDRC was showing um, gains in, uh, in earnings as a result of, of career academies. Just some, one example with the National Academy Foundation, their, their system of um, career um, orientation, you could say, students graduate with what they call the NAF track certification, and then as a result, they get preferential hiring treatment from pretty big companies like AT&T, Xerox, J.P. Morgan Chase. Mm -hmm. So there are plenty of examples to draw from. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to add the, the big picture schools, the big picture network is one example where they are very actively working with students to identify internships that are relevant to them. and. That's an opportunity for students to explore work-based learning. And the, the closest place to visit is in Providence, Rhode Island. That's their flagship school. They, if you're out in California, they also have the San Diego Met, where they, they have the same uh, system. And there really are opportunities for students to figure out what their interests are. But in these career academies, I would just also urge us to think about the fact that these are students are being exposed to a broad range of possible um, jobs within a particular area. So healthcare, for example, they, they are oftentimes going and shadowing at the hospital and they do rounds and so they learn about all different careers and when you talk to them, they'll oftentimes say, I thought I wanted to become a doctor or a nurse, and I had no idea about the range of careers available within the field of healthcare. And so when we talk about these schools that offer these opportunities for students to learn about career pathways, I really want to urge us to not think about them as really narrowly defined career pathways, but they do open up a range of possibilities for students that they oftentimes had not even thought about. Thank you. Ms. Jones, you have a question? I won't put you on the spot. Mr. Batchelor. Thank you, Madam President. I got it now. I'm ready. Um, <clears throat> really quickly, so, uh, so I know, uh, well, one, I think um, obviously I'm in full agreement with the, with the principles of deeper learning. I know it's sorely needed uh, in, in communities uh, like I represent uh, very low income, um, high minority populations. Um, and, but what I'm most concerned about, and I think what, what a lot of us are always concerned about uh, doing education policy that really trickles down to the classroom, uh, and it's a long trickle, uh, is, is, is the practice, right? So there's the principle that I think we set, but then there's the practice um, inside the classroom. Um, and, and so we know that that deeper learning takes more time, that it takes more investment, and that it really takes a, it really takes a shift in, in school's culture uh, to really make it meaningful uh, for students, uh, in their culture and their practice, to make it meaningful for students. Um, and I think when we were having our conversation around our plan around the Every Student Succeeds Act, we really uh, thought about how we use this plan to really inform practice at the school level um, so that the intended consequence that we thought of at the top actually happens uh, where it matters most. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of deeper learning um, and in terms of policies that we may set, um, and more particularly around the Every Student Succeeds Act, in the stage where we are now, do you have any recommendations on how we use ESSA uh, to really inform or, or really encourage uh, deeper learning uh, practices at the school level? Um, 
I would strongly encourage you to use the Title II uh, opportunities in ESSA uh, uh, for promoting effective school leadership and, 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 and teachers. There are, there are unprecedented opportunities for school leadership in Title II, um, and you can use a lot of those dollars uh, to uh, create pipelines, uh, to improve uh, uh, prep for, for leaders. Uh, the Learning Policy Institute will be coming out with a paper soon on uh, both teacher prep and leadership prep for deeper learning. Uh, so um, I, I'm a strong believer also that most learning, adult learning, happens in schools. So I would really encourage you to use the ESSA definition of effective professional learning, which is sustained and collaborative. It's job embedded. It's intensive. Uh, it's uh, uh, informed by data, and it's focused on classroom problems. And, and, and I think that is really one of the keys to deeper learning is you're right. It's not just the policies and, and implementing uh, standards or curriculum. It's the capacity in the schools. The school leaders and the teachers, as you all know, are about 60% of the impact on student, lead, uh, student learning. So that, that would be my encouragement is to look at Title II um, and, and continue on. Uh, uh, you've already got your plan in place, mm -hmm. but to continue to look at the, um, all the new developments in terms of promoting uh, great teachers and leaders. Great, uh, and, and I think se even separate from teachers and leaders, I, I'm kind of going one rung up now. How, what about uh, in LEAs? What, what do you say to LEAs to encourage that practice? To, to, uh, what advice would you give them to encourage that practice at the school level? I think other than. I think that from what we've seen in the spread of deeper learning, it's really helpful if they actually see what it looks like in action and have opportunities to see it for themselves. And I will say a lot of times, the folks that we bring along on our study tours, for example, the last time many of them were in schools was when they were back in high school. And so high school looks very different. And before you can really advocate for this kind of learning that looks very different, that's project oriented, that's very student focused, that is not very teacher focused. It helps that you yourself become convinced that this is learning that can really matter and can make a difference. I think the other thing I will also just add is I had mentioned Monica Martinez's book on deeper learning. She's also written a planning guide to how you, schools can start working to think about implementing deeper learning. And the guide is available, it's on the web, it's freely available, and it's a way for schools to systematically start thinking about how they can actually make this work, so step by step. And I think that making those kinds of resources available to people, and that doesn't cost any money because that's just something that's out there already, but making people aware of, of the fact that they, these resources do exist and the Alliance's website on deeper learning has a plethora of resources, and that's one of the reasons I showed you the video as well this evening. There are four of those videos that are available. Maine is just one of the ones that, one of the states that is highlighted, and then there are three other examples of deeper learning. And that's a, a quick and easy way for people to access in four and a half minutes, get some idea of what it is we're talking about that can then spark a conversation. So. I would really urge uh, the use of all of those. Just real quickly, in terms of ESSA implementation, um, so LEAs, the states, um, the district are required to use at least 7% of the Title I allocation to implement school improvement activities among identified schools. Mm -hmm. So that 7% of Title I is a major opportunity to advance deeper learning if it's implemented well. Another opportunity is that um, there is the flexibility, you don't have to do this, but you can allocate up to 3% of the district's Title I allocation for what are called in the law direct student support services. It can be anything from making advanced coursework available where it's currently not, to providing opportunities for CTE that lead to a, an industry recognized credential. So another major opportunity. A third opportunity would be around the Title IV funds. Although the 
the program was authorized at $1.6 billion. Last year, Congress funded it at $300 million. The, um, um, it's likely to receive an increase um, according to what the House and what the Senate have proposed. Um, but those dollars can be used also to advance um, deeper learning. They can use those, you can use that for digital learning, you can use that for access to rigorous coursework. Great, well I know four minutes goes much faster up here than it does in the real world, so I'll, I'll save my other question for a second round, thank you. Oh, I don't know, I just assume. You, I can keep asking, I just got one more if that's fine. Thank you, um, okay and um, so, so I, I think as you as you mentioned in, in your uh, in your presentation that teachers really do uh, play a role. Obviously, deeper learning is about letting students lead and explore, uh, but but teachers uh, do do play a role. Um, what what advice would you give uh, to school districts in particular um, in terms of professional learning opportunities, in terms of uh, evaluation systems? Uh, what, what would you encourage school systems to do to better prepare uh, their teachers for this type of work? I know there's a lot, but kind of what are, what are those big things uh, that, that need to be done for teachers uh, to feel comfortable doing this work and, and not feel under the gun in terms of all the other things, right? Because deeper learning also also takes time, right? And unfortunately, teachers feel like there's not a lot of it in the school year. They're budgeting every minute. So how, how would you encourage school systems to, to, to assist and encourage teachers to do this work? I'll just give you one quick example from our site visit to Los Angeles High School of the Arts. What was really interesting, they were a linked learning school, and they talked about the fact that they were very excited to become a linked learning school, but that it they initially they jumped all in and were trying to do project-based learning all over the place and they soon realized that they really had to take a step back and make sure that teachers were well trained and started off small. And so I think making these changes, it's critical to make sure that teachers are trained and then also to give them a lot of support and one of the examples they gave, for example, was saying we were designing these massive projects that were taking place over months and months and months and we also were requiring that all four major subject content teachers be involved in that project and we pretty soon realized that that was not necessarily realistic we weren't quite there yet we needed to step back reevaluate and start small and so I think that's one caution that I would urge and so that as as this work is embarked on that you really take time to make sure that the individuals who are heavily impacted in doing it feel supported and feel like they've had an opportunity to really also see what this looks like. So there are numerous institutes now run by various, the various networks. At High Tech High, for example, they have opportunities for people to come and see and learn from the teachers that are being trained there. They also run a, an institute that happens every March where practitioners come from all, not o only all over the country but all over the world to learn from them and there are a lot of teachers primarily at those kinds of institutes. And that's op those are opportunities for professional development for those individuals so that they feel much more comfortable going back into their own environments. I think a lot of the schools of education now also are doing a lot more to prepare students, uh, to prepare teachers to, to teach in these ways of not just the project-based learning, but also the interdisciplinary learning. So making connections between math and science, for example, or math and social studies, and having teachers co-teach those kinds of classes. And that kind of preparation is not widespread, but it's increasing. And, and that's really promising as well, another option to, to help train teachers. Great, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bassett. One more question. Um, so my question is, there's been, I think each of you or some of you have talked about um, AP courses, especially as a way of um, adding rigor and assuring some level of performance. My question is, that is so often recommended, and I know that, um, well, we have so many students who are entering high school so many years behind. And so the question is whether that's the best thing to do. And let me just say, I think it's a good thing to do, and I do want to acknowledge 
um, our own local star, Laura Fuchs, who is an AP teacher who was featured in the New York Times Magazine section um, for teaching AP um, in classes where it might not be, be the norm and I think is quite successful at helping kids reach a certain level. So I don't want to say it's not um, a good thing. I know um, with my own child who wasn't actually ready for it in a formal sense, the fact that you get exposed to a higher level of material, that's a plus. That said, it, I, it sometimes feels like it's recommended because it's there. Um, and is there not some other approach when you're working with students who are many, many years behind that would make more sense? Um, so it's a question. I mean, it's easy in an, in an ESSA accountability thing to say, oh, how many kids are taking AP? And then we make that the basis on which, oh, we've helped improve the school because we've added AP courses. And my question is, is that, is that the right thing to do? Is there something else that would also make sense? So I'll jump in. Um, I would say that adding AP to the accountability system is definitely insufficient. I think that it's a good step that when you look at participation, you also have to dive into those, into those numbers and look at, well, who is participating? Because even though there might not be formal tracking, there is likely to be informal tracking with high school, within a high school, and you have, and it's not equitably distributed as to who is all is, is participating. I think there are, there are other experiences that high schools can provide um, that are not AP, they can get at what you're looking at, and I think most common we see that in dual enrollment or in early college high schools. And so these, um, and the Jobs for the Future is an example of an organization that offers programming where they're looking at students who are overaged and undercredited, and they, rather than remediate, they work at accelerating, and over time, these are students who are earning dual credit so while they're in high school, they're also earning college credit or credit for post-secondary, and they're graduating. It may not take, it may take more than four years, but they're graduating. And so there's an, um, I, would, I would be happy to share with you information about Jobs for the Future as an example, and um, their work with, um, with, uh, with dual enrollment in, in early college. So in short, you're saying that the best response is, um, is college prep material for students who are very far behind. That's just, you would say that's well, sort of the, that the, the preferred practice a, as of now. I think that you don't, you don't start in the ninth grade with an AP class, but you do start, and um, sometimes it's double dosing in the, um, in, the, um, in the core material. You know, using, going into the data and really figuring out why students are behind, sometimes it's, um, it's inadequate preparation Sometimes it is a range of experiences that are happening with the student outside the classroom that are influencing um, their achievements. So it really takes a comprehensive approach. From the academic perspective, I think it takes, um, but with the goal of still accelerating students through high school, having them graduate you know, prepared for post-secondary. So it's not lowering standards, but it's really helping them meet the higher ones. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add that for example, in one school that we visited in Oakland, they talked about the fact that, Oakland, California, they talked about the fact that students, a lot of students come in behind, and what they do is really targeted support systems starting in the ninth grade and making sure that if they need additional tutoring in whatever the subject is, they're getting that. And it's not just being done by the teachers at the school, but they really pull in community volunteers as well. So there is a very targeted effort to make sure to get students as on track as possible and I would say that making sure like Philip said that that system of comprehensive support is in place because you're not just dealing with a lot of issues at the school they are dealing with students are oftentimes coming in with other concerns and that's part of the reason they bring in some support from the, for the from the community as well and I would also just say that the, the project-based nature of a lot of the work that students are engaged in is of a, a higher level typically of what a lot of what's happening in a lot of more traditional high schools i will add on to what my colleagues <laughs> just said and that uh, i think you ought to look at deeper learning as 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 
as being integrated with other kinds of important ways of really understanding all the needs of students. And so I'm thinking about social-emotional learning, where you're focusing on their self-awareness, self-management, uh, their social awareness, relationship building skills, effective decision making, and, uh, and that was actually integrated at the uh, schools we visited in Oakland. Uh, and that full service community school model where we can see kids who really have been ignored and neglected all the way up into high school, suddenly they are full members of a school community. That's how you can turn them around and that's how you can add rigor to their um, um, learning. No, just a very quick question. Is there any reason schools couldn't just pursue this on their own and why it requires state action? Not that I know of. <laughs> well, okay. Last but not least, I'd like to thank you for coming. This was very informative. Um, I'd just like to say my two cents for since I've been quiet as the rest of the board talked and asked questions. However, I think this is a wonderful approach. We're so happy that NASB has partnered with the state board uh, to do this work. And I agree with Dr. Woodruff that we need to start in pre-K and not in the ninth grade. Uh, we would, we would, our children would fare so much better. We would need so less resources to do this work if we started earlier. So after we get the deeper learning embedded in our school system, let's make it start earlier, okay? We, uh, we look forward to, to continue working with you. Um, and help, thank you for helping us improve the atmosphere of education in the District of Columbia. I hope we can call on you in the future to talk to other groups and at other times when we have questions. Is that possible, Mr. Long? Madam President, it's just been, I'll speak for the panel, it's just been <laughs> our pleasure to be here tonight. And of course, you can call me, NASB, and, and, and Dr. Goodwin and Mr. Lovell anytime, I'm sure. We'd love to be able to help. Thank you. We dismiss. With no further business before the board, I would like to Madam entertain President. a motion to adjourn. Madam President? Yes? Could, could I just uh, no. point of privilege, Madam President? <laughs> I, I promise. I, I just wanted. I just wanted to make sure all of us wished our, our newest student member a happy birthday. That. Oh, see, <laughs> didn't know that. See, I, I guess I took your thunder. I'm sorry. No. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's it's Talia's birthday. Maria and Talia. We are, you were late, so we've already addressed Maria's. Oh. Um, yeah. <laughs> And I would like to adjourn the meeting, but um, and then we can tell Talia, happy birthday. So can we do this in that order? Okay. Um, with no further business before the board, I would like to entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All in favor, say. Aye. All opposed. The ayes have it in the public meeting of the District of Columbia State Board of Education is adjourned at 726. 726.